The respiratory system is designed to help exchange gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, with the environment and your blood. Now, red blood cells have in them a special protein called hemoglobin that can bind to oxygen and carry it. Now, that hemoglobin can also help the red blood cells transport carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide can also be transported in the blood in the form of bicarbonate ion, and that's done through the help of an enzyme called uh, carbonic anhydrase. And what it does is it combines carbon dioxide gas with water from the blood plasma to form carbonic acid, which then disassociates because it's an acid and gives off this H plus ion, forming bicarbonate ion. The nice thing about this is it helps buffer the blood to prevent any other pH changes. Now, how do we do it? Well, we use lungs. Other creatures on this planet use their skin to exchange uh, gases. Some use gills, obviously like fish. Insects, a lot of them have these little tubes running through their body to help gases get into their uh, bodies. But again, like I said, we use lungs, just like birds and many other vertebrate uh, land animals. Now, the reason that we have lungs instead of using our skin or gills is that to exchange gases, you need to be able to dissolve the oxygen and carbon dioxide, which means you need to have that organ of respiration to be wet. So by having lungs, which are inside our body, we can retain water since we're on land, which tends to be a lot drier than water. We also need to warm the air so that it doesn't disturb the internal temperatures. So let's take a quick look over here and see how is this accomplished. Now this begins with this portion right here. Above that we have our nasal cavity. When you inhale air, your nose hairs, which some of us have more of than others, jealous, they help filter out larger particles, pollen, things like that. Then the mucus also helps trap little bits of fungal spores, bacteria, and other things, because you're trying to cleanse the air. Now, you have blood vessels, which some of you discover maybe when you're a little kid and you started digging around, and those blood vessels are really close to the surface to help give heat to the air that's coming in and to exude water to help humidify the air. It then goes through the opening to your trachea, the, this long tube here called the glottis. You have a little flap called the epiglottis, epi means above. That epiglottis closes the opening to the larynx or voice box, which is at the top of the trachea. That epiglottis closes in order for you to be able to swallow food and not have it go down into your trachea and lungs. So once the air goes through the glottis, it enters the larynx, our voice box. It then goes through the trachea, and you can see there's these weird little rings over there. Those are bands of cartilage that help keep it inflated. So as the air goes down, it then branches into these tubes called bronchi. The bronchi are the branches here. They go into smaller and smaller bronchi until finally you get to these tiny little branches, the final ends of the bronchi, which are called bronchioles. Now we're in the alveolar ducts. At the end of each of these branches, you will have these clusters of little sacs. Each sac is called an alveolus. And an alveolus' job is to be a really thin, simple sac. And each alveolus, or alveoli is the plural, as you can see here, these yellow sacs are surrounded by blood vessels. And they're thin enough that oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas can cross the membranes very quickly and easily. And they're a little bit moist. Um, not too much, and you actually produce a special chemical that acts like a surfactant, which means it disrupts hydrogen bonding. And that keeps those sacs, which don't have any real strong support, from collapsing and sticking to each other. Like uh, if your pants get wet, they start sticking to your legs like that. Now, again, I pointed out how the cartilage rings here prevent that kind of collapse. But if you had cartilage helping hold up, open the alveoli, you would have problems with them being too thick. Now, these little red things here, those are muscles. And what those muscles do, they're smooth muscles, they're visceral muscles, and they can open and close to increase or decrease the amount of air that you're inhaling and exhaling every moment. Now, let's take a look at how inhalation and exhalation works. The breathing is controlled by the brain stem. In there, you have special neurons sitting at the base of your uh, brain that are detecting data coming in from sensory receptors that are detecting changes in pH or carbon dioxide concentration. Now, a lot of times people think, well, I breathe to get an oxygen. That's why you want to breathe, but you're actually triggering when to inhale and exhale based on the buildup of pH, uh, sorry, of carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide you have, the more acidic your blood, and that depresses the pH. So when the pH gets too low, too acidic, you, that signals your body, time to exhale, get that carbon dioxide out, and suck in some fresh air. 
right? Now, what this does, the, carb the brainstem sends signals to the diaphragm muscle, which sits at the base of your chest, right above your abdominal region, and it also helps control the ribcage muscles. Let's take a look at this. What a lot of people don't get is that when you inhale, what you're doing is you're contracting that diaphragm. That's why your stomach sticks out when you inhale, because this diaphragm muscle here is pushing down on the abdomen, as you can see in this diagram here, shoving your guts out, because there's no other space to go. That helps expand the space of the chest. Now your rib cage can move a little bit, so you have muscles on the, in, on the outside of the rib cage that help pull it up, and that helps increase the space of your chest cavity. By increasing the space, that drops the pressure compared to the outside, so air rushes in from the higher pressure outside. Then, when I want to breathe out, what you don't think about is that most of the action of exhaling, or expiration as physiologists like to call it, expiration happens mainly by relaxing. You relax that diaphragm muscle, and then the muscles that keep your guts from toppling all over the place, they help push that diaphragm back up. Your chest starts to relax. Now you can help this along by tightening your abs to squish that diaphragm up even faster. You've also got muscles on the inside of your rib cage that can pull the rib cage down to help increase the pressure in your lungs, squirting the air out. So you just cycle back and forth between these two, and that's how we breathe. So I hope that I helped inspire you to breathe some of this stuff in and learn more about the respiratory system.